Hi, welcome to the Lifetime Capital Gains Exemption in Canada video series. My name is John McElroy. I will be walking you through the presentation today. We're looking at the basic rules. We're starting off in video two. I've split it into two parts. A, we'll talk about the time of sale tests, and in B, we'll talk about the 24-month holding period tests. So what tests need to be passed to qualify? When you sell your shares, what tests do you have to make sure that you meet to be eligible for that capital gains exemption? Well, the tests cover three general areas, ownership of the shares, control of the corporation, and the assets contained in the corporation. But the tests also cover two time periods, the time of sale, that's a period, or that's a point in time test, and the 24-month holding period, and that, of course, is a period test. Let's create a table and make it easier to see. In the columns, we'll put time, time of sale, and the 24-month holding period. In the rows, we'll put ownership, control, and assets. And we'll set up some check boxes here and the goal will be to get a check mark in all six check boxes. There really are six tests that you have to meet and our goal is to make sure you get a check mark in all six boxes. So what about the time of sale? What are these tests? Let's take a look at check box number one, the ownership test. Now remember we're talking about the ownership at the time of sale. Well there's four possible ownership structures in terms of who owns those shares. One, this is by far the most common one, this might be the only one that's of interest to you in this video, and that is you own the shares directly. There you are, you own shares, you're hoping it's a qualified small business corporation, but when you sell those shares and you get a capital gain, can you use your lifetime capital gains exemption? Well, strictly from an ownership perspective, if you own the shares directly, you're in great shape, you're going to pass that test, you're A-OK. -okay. Let's look at a couple of other ones that don't come up quite as often. Number two, what if you own the shares indirectly through a partnership? So you're a partner in a partnership and it's the partnership that owns the Qualified Small Business Corporation shares. And of course the partnership sells them, there's a capital gain involved. And the question is, do you get to use your capital gains exemption on that partnership capital gain? Do you pass the test? And the answer is, yeah, you do. You do pass the ownership test. That is a perfectly legitimate structure. So you can own the shares directly or through a partnership. In both cases, you'll pass the ownership test. Now the third structure I'll go through quickly because it only applies to very special situations, but it comes up often enough to mention, and that is if you gift the shares to your spouse or your common law partner, under this kind of a scenario, you own some shares in a QSBC, and you think, you know what, I'll give them to my spouse. I'll gift them. Now my spouse will own the shares, and so hopefully when the spouse sells the shares, to a buyer and there's a capital gain, my spouse can use that capital gain. Hang on, the attribution rules might apply. We're not going to go into them all in detail, but attribution rules exist that might attribute the capital gain back to you. So your spouse doesn't get to keep that capital gain, it's actually going to be taxable in your hands. Now, can you use your lifetime capital gains exemption in this scenario? Well, the good news is you can, so it's a bit of good news, bad news. I mean, you gave them to your spouse in the first place because you wanted to double the amount of people who can use the capital gains exemption. That's not going to work out, but if you have room, you can use your lifetime capital gains exemption. How do you get your spouse involved in terms of multiplying the number of people that are eligible for the capital gain? When we get to the family trust a little bit later on in this video series, I'll show you exactly how to set that up. Now, the fourth structure is when you own the shares indirectly through a holding company. In other words, you own a holding company and the holding company owns the shares of the Qualified Small Business Corporation. Now, that works if the companies are connected, but I'm not going to cover that in this video. We're going to cover that in a later video. But the first three structures are fine. You're going to qualify for the lifetime capital gain exemption. If you own the shares directly, probably 95% of the people watching this video fall into that category. Or if you own the shares indirectly through a partnership. Or in that very special circumstance where you gave the shares to your spouse, and the capital gain gets attributed back to you. In any one of those three cases, you're going to get a check mark in that first box. What about check box number two? What about the control test? Remember, we're talking about the control of the corporation now. The corporation in terms of the shares you're going to sell to be um, attempting to claim your capital gains exemption. Who has to control that corporation at the time of sale? Well, to meet this test, the shares own must be shares of a Canadian-controlled private corporation called a CCPC. Now, what does control mean? Well, generally it means 50% plus one of the voting shares of a corporation. So you have to be a CCPC at the time of sale. 
the two things that pop out of that definition are number one, it's got to be a private corporation, and number two, it has to be Canadians. The way the rules are set up is they explain who can't control the corporation. So we'll take a look at the ways that we can fail this test, and there's three ways. Number one, if the company is not private. So you own shares in a corporation and, and you find a buyer to buy them, you have a capital gain and you want to use your lifetime capital gains exemption, you have to answer the question, who controls the company at the time of sale? Because if, it's, if the company is controlled by a public listed corporation, well, you know what? You're going to fail the test. Because the control test precludes us from owning shares in a company controlled by a publicly listed corporation to qualify for the lifetime capital gains exemption. That's not going to work. Number two, similar scenario. What if you're not Canadian? And you're not Canadian if you own shares in a corporation and when you find a buyer that buys those shares and you have your capital gain and you want to use your exemption, if a non-resident controls the corporation, you're also going to fail the test. The control test has failed if the corporation is controlled by a public company or if it's controlled by a non-resident. What's the third one? Well, one last time, you own the shares, you find a buyer, the buyer buys the shares, you've got a capital gain, you want to use your lifetime capital gains exemption. You know by now you have to check to see who controls the company. So when you check that out, you look and you see that some non-residents does do hold shares in the company, but not enough to control the company. So far, so good. It's not that non-residents can't own shares in the corporation, they just can't control it. And then you discover that a public corporation also owns shares in the corporation, but again, not enough to control them. So now what, are we okay? Well, we discover that even though neither the public corporation nor the non-resident individually control the corporation, together they have enough shares to control that company. And if that's the case, you're going to fail the test for the third time and you're not going to be able to use your lifetime capital gains exemption. Now, I don't want to make this complicated because it's really not. In summary, as long as the corporation is not controlled by a public corporation, non-residents, or some combination of both, you're going to get a check mark in that second checkbox. All right. What about the third checkbox? What about the asset test at the time of sale? Now, no doubt about it, this one is a little bit more tricky. Let's look at the basic rule first. Now, I've broken the rule into four segments to make it a little easier to read. By the way, I'm not quoting the act here, I'm paraphrasing it. And the rule says, all or substantially all of the fair market value of the assets must be used principally in an active business carried on primarily in Canada. Let's take a real quick look at each segment. All or substantially all, what does that mean? Well, to CRA, that means 90% or more. Now, no one's saying that if you had 89, you might, might not be able to get away with it. Maybe you'd be able to win your case in court, but you might have to go to court because CRA tends to challenge it if it's less than 90%. But the, the rule doesn't say 90%. It says all or substantially all. 90% is how that rule is interpreted. Of the fair market value of the assets, what does that mean? It means we're not talking about accounting numbers here. So book value gets ignored, depreciation gets ignored, all assets have to be adjusted to their fair market value. Now, those assets must be used principally in an active business. And this is the tripping point. This is where a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and business owners get a little confused. What does that mean? Well, I'll walk you through it with an example. The first thing we do is identify all the assets in the corporation. Let's just take a situation where we have five assets. Let's say this corporation owns a vacant lot. That's the first asset. There's a delivery van involved, office furniture, cash reserves, raw materials. And the next step is to adjust them all to fair market value. Now what? Well, we have to sort them into two baskets. Used principally means used more than 50%. That's the little interpretation that CRA gives it. So we've got to take all these assets and we've got to put them in one of two baskets. Assets that are used more than 50% in the active business, i.e. principally, and assets that are not used 50% in the active business. And as we go through the sorting, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is an active business? And an active business really, for our purposes, is any business at all except a business generating income from property. 
So if you have a business generating rent, well, that's not an active business. If it's generating interest income, that's a not active business income. Royalties, not active business income. Let's start sorting. We put them in the baskets according to whether they're used principally in the active business. Let's start off with the vacant lot. Is that an active business asset? Well, no, it's not. It's vacant. It doesn't do anything. It just sits there. So clearly, it's not being used in the active business. We put it in the second basket. What about a delivery van? Well, sure, we're using that all the time. The same with the office furniture. Cash reserves, that's a little bit more tricky. Are the cash reserves an active business asset? Well, it all comes down to how much cash do you actually have on hand and how much cash do you need for working capital? And it's the difference between those two that determines how much cash is too much cash. And the jurisprudence and the tax courts have developed a framework of analysis that says if the cash can be removed without destabilizing your business, there is a problem. That excess cash is not considered an active business asset. So let's assume that's the case in this example. And so the cash reserves, at least some of them, are going to go into the uh, uh, second basket, use less than 50% in the active business. And of course, raw materials, that's an active business asset. Remember, use more than 50% means used principally. So we can change the name of that first box. To, These are assets that are used greater than 50% in the active business, meaning they're used principally in the active business. And the second basket will rename to assets not used principally in the active business. Hopefully you're following along here. We identified all the assets. We determined whether they're used principally in the active business or not. Then we took these assets and now we have to adjust them to their fair market value. And we have the fair market value of the assets in both baskets. And now we apply the test. When we add up the asset value in that first basket, do we get a number that represents greater than 90% of all the assets in the corporation? And is the second basket, basket less than 10%? If that's the case, then we're in good shape. We've passed the test. But you know what? We actually can't check box number three yet. We can't give the check mark yet. Why? Because the fourth part says, that the active business has to be carried on primarily in Canada. So once the active business condition is met, now we apply the test, where is the active business carried on? And that does depend upon the kind of business we're talking about. If you have a sales or leasing business, typically the business is carried on wherever the corporation is resident. If the corporation is resident in Canada, then your sales business is carried on in Canada. But what if your business is a business rendering services? Well, that's different. Now you have to determine where the revenue is generated. It has to be sorted into two baskets. Again, first basket, we take the revenue that's generated from services rendered in Canada. We collect the revenue um, generated from services rendered outside of Canada. And we see where they lay vis-a-vis -vis the overall percentage. And as long as the revenue in the first basket, services rendered in Canada are greater than 50%, and in the second basket, by a default, less than 50%, you're going to get the check mark. All right? You're going to pass the test that the business is carried on primarily in Canada. Since this is fuzzy in the minds of a lot of business owners, I don't blame them, by the way. I have to review these rules all the time myself just to make sure I keep them straight. Let's summarize. How do we get that third checkbox? Well, it's a two-stage test. Stage one, 90% of the fair market value of the assets are used principally in the active business. Call that the active business test. And stage two says, where is the active business carried on? And it has to be carried on primarily in Canada to pass both tests. And you do need to pass both tests. You do have to have an active business. It does have to be carried on in Canada for you to qualify for the capital gains exemption and get that checkbox checked, number three, for assets at the time of sale. That's what we've been looking at in this video. My name is John McElroy. My number is 905-267-1043. I always love to get feedback from people. Uh, my email address is below. If you like the video, please click the like button. Love to get your comments. Hopefully you're enjoying these videos. Meanwhile, I'll see you in the next video.